What a name, Jesse. Hallelujah. You know, what is in a name? Yeah, good name. A biblical name. I always run into people when they have a Christian name. I said, okay, there it is. I can start from there. Praise God. Amen. So men's conference is coming. Those of you that are registered, those of you who told me you're going, I need to really know you're going. Uh, you can make your pay your money, put in an envelope, and it will be deposited into uh, our church account. But I'm writing one check to Victory Church of Musjo towards that. This is the cheapest men's conference. It's cheap, $65. And we're going to be hanging out. I have a buddy of mine. His name is uh, Adrian Duquette. Amen. I look at Adrian walking the streets of Musjo, completely lost, completely lost. He was in a life where a drug addict from Angus Campbell. Now, I want you to visualize that. That was who Adrian was. And today, if you look at him, you'll think I'm telling lies or something. God has changed him. He never went to detox or anything, but God changed him. And he's blessed with a family. He has a house there in Musjo, and he opened his house for us to go. And, uh, and uh, we're going to be hanging out there in his house. He, he missed the fellowship. Sometimes he comes all the way to our home group here because he wanted the fellowship. So there's uh, no excuse, guys. We can go. And then it's only 45 minutes. You can drive there and come. So we are going to invade Musja. Amen? Not the British invasion. Regina, Wellsprings Victory Church invading Musja. Amen? We'll go there and we'll have fun. The spies there. They have all kinds of creative games that you can participate in. Uh, I'm yet to find out what it is. But uh, maybe paintball or something. I, I'm not sure. So you can register. Amen? Amen. So make sure you come. And then uh, uh, baptism, if you're not baptized, you need to be baptized. But before you get baptized, you have to be born again. Amen? Amen. You have to do first things first, to get saved and, and be baptized. So today we're going to uh, just, uh, it's a Thanksgiving Sunday, and a lot of people are away visiting their families and getting all the turkeys they can get and all the stuffings they can get. And all the gravies they can get. And then they can sleep, right? <laughs> I can feel that already. The gravy. Praise God. Eh? But I wanted to give a time for a, a brother of mine here just to, to, just to testify, to give God the glory. You know, see, sometimes we don't give God the glory for the things that he has done. You see, God is doing things. But we don't give him the glory. In Romans chapter 1, it talks about the people that even though they knew God, they did not give him what? The glory. Giving God the glory is to recognize that all that we have is from him. All that we have is from him. The very breath that you have is really valuable. Your breath. How many people didn't make it this morning? They, they didn't make it. So you are no special. God, you know, you're still breathing. It's because of him. Praise God. And we need to give him the praise and the glory. And I know this brother was praying. He was really praying. He was in a place of making a decision and not knowing what he will do with his life. And he came here to the prayer meeting. You know, many of us were in that place. You can come to a place where you don't have answers. You don't know even who to talk to. Not even your pastor. But you can come here to a prayer meeting, and then while we're praying, it may not sound really very profound, the prayers. And I always say prayer meetings doesn't have to sound very profound. Prayer is boring. But only to those people who don't know what it is. <laughs> it is powerful. You know, somebody's praying, and, and if you really don't have faith, you think, oh, he's just... He's just you know, wishing good words for somebody to feel good. No, it's not. It works. And so we prayed for our brother. He was, I was really feeling for him. He wanted to leave Saskatchewan and go where he can. I said, no, you're going to stay. You're not going anywhere. But he listened. 
Sometimes people, oh, what are you talking, Pastor? I say, you're going to stay here, but we're going to pray. Amen? We're going to pray that even here God can do things. And I want you to share what happened, brother. Hallelujah. Uh, years back, I, I got a job where... Let me turn that on. Oh, we're done. I, I get to run away a lot. So over the years, I was able to run away from my problems and uh, go wherever I wanted, make a big mess, but I always knew I was able to run away and... God blessed me as a single father with, with my children here, and I had a really good job that I really took for granted for years, for about six years, and got laid off and started struggling around the city here trying to, um, you know, make a living for my children and stuff, but I had a, also had a time in, in Fort McMurray, Alberta, where I can make really good money, and, um, I, you know, I could go there and take time off or whatever, and, and it was coming to the winter time, and last winter was, I really struggled last winter. And uh, really fell into a lot of debt. So this year, I was, all of a sudden I got really angry. I was sitting at work, I got really angry. I said, you know what, I'm not missing out on money this year. People are having nice things, and my kids are going to have nice things, and I'm going to have a nice house, and I'm sick of Saskatchewan. And, but I made God a promise. I made God a promise years back that I would, uh, that I would raise these children in the church. Now, in Alberta, the, I didn't even know if I was going to be home when I got there, but I was going to get them a Christian nanny. I had everything all planned out, what I was going to do for them. But I wasn't going to be in their life because I was going to be away working. That's the truth. And uh, the closer I got, I, I went and I put a resume in. I had a job two minutes later. I got a phone call. You, get, you start on, they give me the date and everything, and whew, that was awesome. But the closer I got to that date, I uh, started really squirming. My insides weren't feeling good. And I tell you, if you see me at the Cornwall Center, nine times out of ten, it's because I'm lost and I'm looking for answers. So for some reason, I choose the Cornwall Center because I'm also a street guy, come from the street, um, by choice. And uh, so I always seem to go back there, and I, and I was racing around the Cornwall Center, and, and um, I was feeling like I was running to God, then I was running away from God, then I was running to God, and I was laying in my bed on Saturday night, and uh, God kept saying, to, you know, just relax, just relax. And as I was laying there in bed, I was thinking, you know what? I got Jesus in my life. Now, why am I laying here all by myself? I need to be at prayer. And I promised God that I would bring my kids to the church. And so I wanted to be in a man of my word, and I picked up the boys. We got going, and we came in the church here, and there were so many prayers that were just answering my questions. And it was amazing that night how, how the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And uh, I just got honest about how I was feeling, the things I was going through. And as Pastor David prayed for me, he said it. He said, rest. Be He's still. Chill. And uh, I was like, wow. You know, that's the word. And um, so I chose a job with Enbridge, um, doing their uh, pumping stations. And I did the test, and a well test, and I passed, and I was heading out. And as I got to the outskirts of Regina, I got a phone call for a job in Musha at the Musha Hospital for a couple of days. They wanted me back. Okay, I'll be back in a little bit. I told them when I was coming back. Then I got um, halfway to Chamberlain. I got another call for another job till Christmas. So I was like, okay, yeah, okay, good. This is really looking good for me here. And then I got even further out to the station, which is five hours away. I got another job out at the R um, ammonia plant. 18 months work, which is more than enough, right? <laughs> Man, I started praising. The, the, I don't think, like, how am I going to get out of this Enbridge thing now, right? <laughs> how am I going to get out of there? Well, it turned out that when I got there, um, I failed my job test. You have to do a well test every time you, you go to these places. I passed the x-ray. The weld was good, but the people who tested me didn't test me in the proper parameters for my welding. So they failed me. So I said, here's my way out. So they said, we're going <laughs> to set you up another test. I said, I don't want it. I don't want it. <laughs> and I think they were kind of surprised because people go for these jobs, right? And I was like, I didn't want it. I was heading home to Regina. I, you know what? I left so fast from that job. <laughs> that I did not even fill out my T4 slip. So I can't even get paid yet. <laughs> I just wanted to be home with my boys, and here I am. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah.
Anybody else that want to give thanks? Amen. God is good. God is good. Wilson. Wilson has, you know, God is good. And I know the prayers that have gone behind this. You may not know, but I know. Hallelujah. Let him talk about it. Amen. So it's alumnus online. Same line, brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, about three weeks, three, four weeks ago, um, through work, I had to go do a training at another place. And I was really busy covering for other managers, so I told, told the human resources, say, you got to get somebody else. I'm too busy. You know, get somebody else. And they tried, and no, we can't. So I had to go do the training to this other place uh, here in Regina. So, okay, fine, I went. As I was there, I met, I met one of, another manager, uh, basically the same thing that I do. Um, and uh, she told me, Wilson, I'm retiring. <laughs> so, and I had told her, you know, if you ever retire, you got to remind me. You got to tell me. <laughs> anyway, so I haven't seen this lady, but anyway, she told me I'm retiring. And she said, and today's the last day to apply. But come on, give me a break, you know. Not even a time to pray or think, you know. One thing is that when you're in prayer, when, you know, you're in constant uh, connection with God, God also gives you the peace. Although, I mean, as human, I was nervous. I said, do I or do I not, right? So I went back, back home and I prayed again and said, I got, you know, I'll apply. So I did apply. It was a uh, long story short. I, did, I had the interview last week and I got the offer on Friday. Um, and it's not that the place that I, I'm at is a bad place to work. It's actually it's an awesome place to work. I really love it. But this position, though, it's going to be, you know, man is good, right? <laughs> so it is going to be more money. Um, it is going to be also more along the lines of uh, where I came from. Um, I used to be a property manager, and now basically I will be managing also the maintenance departments as well. Uh, whereas for years when I stopped doing property management, I only managed the housekeeping laundry of the places that I've been at. So God is good, you know, and when I did talk to, the, to my boss, to the CEO of where I am, um, he did said, you know, we, because we can't compare, compare the two different jobs. It's completely two different jobs. So she said, or he says, or yeah, I wish, I mean, I, I would like to pay you what they're paying you, but they can't, you know, this just cannot be done. Uh, but I wish you wouldn't go. Um, but I, at the same time, he said, you know, I know you have to look out for your family, and, you know, you, so you prayed, and this is what God has given you. So, I, God is good. I mean, it's way more money, it's more vacation, it's awesome. Amen. <laughs> so, Amen. Hallelujah. One more person. Praise God. You can hold on just a minute. Yeah. Okay. So I was 17 when I got pregnant. And then I graduated high school, moved in with my boyfriend and the father of my son. And then six months later, we split. And I was devastated. I didn't know what I was going to do. So for the last six months, my son and I were couch surfing, looking for a place to stay, anyone who would take us. And we were staying with my grandparents for a while, and I was, I had nothing. My ex took everything. I didn't have a job, and my EI had just ended, and I was looking for a job, and I couldn't find anything. And I had applied for school, but I didn't think I'd get in, because the lady on the phone had told me I was number 35 on the waiting list. And then three weeks ago, I got a call from SIAS, and they said, can you start school next week? And I was like, oh, um, I don't know. I have no money. And they're like, oh, just apply for student loans and come. And so I did. And then the next day, I found daycare for my son, which was incredible because they didn't have a room for him at that daycare. But they said, we'll make a spot. Okay. We'll make it work. And so I said, OK. And then I was freaking out because I had nowhere to stay here. And I'm like, well, I can't commute back from Moose Jaw. That's crazy. And then the next day, I found a place. And then I found money to pay for that place. And now I'm going to school, which I didn't think I would do. I thought I'd just find a minimum wage job and make it work, but God definitely has a plan for me and for my son. And I know that I definitely named my son the right name because his name means God brings strength. And if it wasn't for my son, I definitely wouldn't be going back to school. So God definitely has a purpose for everyone. Can I just say something? 
Uh, Alicia and us, our family, we have a long history. I've taught her from grade five, six, seven, seven and a half. Uh, she was my student, and we were good friends with her family. And uh, it's, she, I know she just loves God. She just, all her life, that's all she talked about was loving God. And she used to sing and worship. And, and so in, embrace her into the family. You know, um, uh. tough things happen. And people... Uh, go through the storms, but God is a God who takes us out of those storms and sets our feet on the rock to stand. So please embrace her and Kai, who's just adorable. Amen. And welcome to Wild Springs. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, recently, I've been going through a lot of struggles. I've always struggled with addictions, both with alcohol and drug use. Uh, I actually went back to Saskatoon not too long ago. Uh, Brandon and Johnny had actually helped me get my stuff and got me ready to go on the way. I went down to Saskatoon. I had visited with my mother who actually just recently got out of jail. And so it was, uh, it was a great you know, reunion to be with her again, just to share that bond, the, the love that we've always had for one another. Um, when I had come back, I had some money. So I was staying at motels anywhere I could. Uh, the money ran out, of course, because money goes quickly. Uh, I didn't have a job because about a month ago, my boss had actually taken off to go elk hunting, and so he had left me with no work. It was a huge struggle, but, you know, I always had the faith, and my lady had always been by my side supporting me, letting me know that, you know, God is good, that he will be there for us, and he will provide when we are needing. And... Just on Friday, I went down to the labor ready at the Salvation Army. I waited there for about an hour and a half to about two hours, thinking that maybe there's not going to be no work today. Something inside of me had told me that maybe I should wait just a little bit longer and, you know, something will prevail. Sure enough, I had gotten uh, a labor ready job and I worked out outside and it was a very beautiful day. If you guys can recall Friday, it was a very, very beautiful day. And so it was nice. I did some yard work, you know, pulled weeds. I had, uh, got a hold of a couple other places too as well. Actually, the same day that Friday when I was working, I ended up getting a call from not only Home Depot for a job, but also a place. And so me and my lady will be moving into our place very, very quickly. And I will be starting at the Home Depot in Victoria very, very quickly as well. And, you know, I just, I knew that I had to keep praying and I had to have the faith and just believe that everything will work out. And sure enough, everything's going good. Our daughter's going to be here very, very soon. You know, God is good. God Amen. is good. Amen. 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 <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. God is good. Hallelujah. We give him thanks. Thank you, Lord. I just wanted you to, uh, we want to look at scriptures. Thanksgiving. Hallelujah. It's not just for us to go around and thank each other, but we need to thank God. Amen? Amen? Amen. Because he's the source of all things. Hallelujah. Let's look at First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 34. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 34. Who is back there? Visaka. Oh, that's baby. Okay. Okay, let's all say it together. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let's say it one more time. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his mercies endures forever. One more time. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Amen. Sometimes we, you need to say those things, not for somebody else's benefit, but for your own benefit. Like David, King David, he said, Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? He's talking to his soul. Put thou hope in God. He's talking to his soul. Because that's where all the struggles in life is, is what is insight. And he said, why are you struggled from within me? Put thy hope in God. Hallelujah. I wanted us to look at uh, another scripture here which I love. 
Hallelujah. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 to 17. Hallelujah. You see, because we're living at the time, many of you are going through struggles that you probably don't have anything to be thankful for. And I wanted you to look at this. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 to 18. Hallelujah. Rejoice always. Eh? Pray without ceasing. Eh? In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Hallelujah. For you. You see, oh, well, Pastor David, you don't know what I'm going through. I don't have to know. Actually, I don't have to. But what you're going through is not new. It's not exceptional. It doesn't make you completely different from anybody else that walked this planet or is living today. Everybody's going through stuff, right? We all go through stuff. The same devil everywhere. The same feeling of discouragement is spread all over. Some people can get discouraged with something little that maybe I will not be discouraged with. But the reality is, it is called discouragement. And the, the, the aim of that discouragement, the purpose, is to make you lose heart so that you will lose your faith. And your faith is very important to God. God is interested in you trusting him. And so a lot of people are very discouraged. But during this time of thanksgiving, some people are really excited because things are going the way they want it. And so they have something to be thankful for. But there are some people that don't have even a grocery in their fridge to eat. And so what happens is they say, well, you can be happy to go to church. No, see, see we, we got it wrong. The concept of coming to church is not because we figured things out. We come here because we have no idea what we're going to do with our lives. Things are not going the way we wanted it. So we come here because we want encouragement. Sick people go to hospital. Christians go to church. Why? Because they, they acknowledge they have need. A Christian, to my definition, is somebody who is needy. Somebody who has a need. And he found an answer to his needs in Christ. And that's why he goes to church. Amen? Amen. That's why he goes to church. And so I want to encourage you to put your hope in God. Because we are living at a time where it is very hard to overflow with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. So a lot of people are out today visiting and enjoying food with their families. Psalm 100 verse 4. Psalm 100 verse 4. It says, enter his gates with? With thanksgiving. Enter his gates, not with complaining and murmuring. Some people think, oh, I'm going to God because, oh yeah, Christians, they go to church and they use God as a crutch. And people, yeah, yeah, I don't have any problems, so I don't have to go to church. No, that's not why we go to church. You see, we go to church because we want, you know, you don't, may not have any problem at all. That's the reason you need to go to church. You have problems, <laughs> you go to church. You go there because you want to worship God, amen? You want to worship Him. He said, enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. Bless His name. You see, some people, if you, have you ever wondered, why do we have to go to church and sing? I have become song weary. I don't know about you. I have become song weary. Because the world is full of songs. You go everywhere, there's a song going on. There's a tune going on. Okay? Even in the Christian world, there are all kinds of songs that are coming up. Boom, 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 boom. You know, people walk with headphones on their head and there's always something going on. Boom, boom, boom. You know what happened? On Sunday, you come to church and we have a beautiful worship like this going on. And you've become desensitized and oversaturated that a beautiful song of the Lord is not even getting you excited anymore. 
And you begin to wonder why, what, what are these people doing singing? No, it's, it's this, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to play down worship. I, am, I love worship, praise God. But I'm just trying to tell you that you have to guard your heart. Too much of things, just like on, on a Thanksgiving Day, too much of turkey, tomorrow you will not feel like looking at a turkey anymore. Right? Too much of things. So you have to be careful that your ears, what you receive and what you hear is actually what you need. Yes. Eh? So that's why I found out. You know, like I, sometimes I have to stop. Okay, I heard a song. I always have one or two songs per week ringing inside my, my spirit. I have a song. Whether I'm at work or I'm doing something, there's always a song. We are running, chasing after all that you are. We are running after him. Okay, that could be a song for the whole week. But people, you know, we live in a world of consumerism and we become desensitized that when we go to the house of the Lord and there is the worship team doing their best and we're sitting. Mm -hmm. It's like Canadian Idol or American Idol where the judge is dissatisfied. The judges are not satisfied because that guy has no good voice. So oh, it's not good enough. Actually, that's what we're doing. You're sitting in the house of God, looking at the worship leader and saying, no, I don't think you, you tweaked it really good enough for me to praise. Wow. This is not a place for that. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. This, you come to the house of God to worship him, amen, and give him thanks and lift up the name of Jesus. It is not a place where we stand as judges sitting and saying, oh, was that girl beautiful the way she said, oh, that one is good, that, that song was good, that was right, so I'm going to stand up and, uh, and I'm going to say, yes, you can go to Hollywood. No, that's not what it's all about. This is a place of worship. And so we have to guard ourselves that when we come to the house of God, that we don't become desensitive. I'm really concerned for what you put inside you. Sometimes we just need to be quiet. Yeah, you just need to be quiet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Quiet yourself and think about God. Think about what he's done for you and how he has blessed you. Is Jesus not good enough for us to give him praise? For us to give him thanks? Yes, he is. He is. You see, people are, uh, people are becoming desensitized. And I'm talking about being desensitized. What could be the reason for us to turn ourselves from people that used to have faith? Strong faith. And I talked last Sunday uh, uh, that your faith, the faith that you're full of it today may not necessarily be the same thing tomorrow because your faith goes up and down. Eh? Your faith grows and your faith also can be depleted. So what you do as Romans chapter 10 verse 17, it says faith comes to you by hearing, hallelujah, by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So when we gather together and we praise God, we lift up the name of Jesus. I'm telling you our faith get lifted up. As we lift that name through worship and through songs and then we hear the word, our faith begins to grow. And your faith begins to grow. And you need to nurture your faith because we are living at a time where people are losing their faith. People are losing their faith. It is happening. It is happening all over the place. Uh, I was on Facebook. Uh, okay, there. Somebody put uh, uh, an article that was written. How many of you heard about the movie Left Behind? Left Behind series. Eh? And then there's another group that is old. The rapture is... Nobody's going to be left behind. There's no such thing as being left behind. This, the rapture thing is even not in the Bible. For 200 years, the Christians 
started believing only 200 years ago in rapture. Not nobody believing. You know, all kinds of things that are crafted and written using words that are, uh, some of them I honestly don't know. I have to look at the dictionary. So it looks like if you know those words, so you're correct. And they are luring a lot of Christians away from the word. And I wanted to get to that because being desensitized because of too many controversies that are going on regarding what is actually happening. I'd rather go and watch the Left Behind movie. I'm not a movie guy. Ask my family, they'll tell you. I got discouraged watching movies when I saw how it was done. <laughs> I was in India because in India, any street, there's a movie going on. Actors are running around and jumping around. I said, is this how they do it here? And they piece it together and all of us go and, oh, yeah, right. So I'm not excited about movies after that, after knowing how it is done. It's like if you go to McDonald's and watch how the food is done, you may not eat it. <laughs> But I'm talking about, after knowing how these movies are done, they're just, uh, well, I'm not excited about it. But if I go and watch a movie, in, if I can pick between two movies, the Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> People running around, Dracula. Ah, you know, instead of watching that, I might as well go and watch The Left Behind. Right? Maybe I don't... Now, I'm not saying all what they talked about in that Left Behind movie is actually right. But it's just a movie, right? People say it's just a movie. Well, if it's a movie, why are they criticizing Left Behind? It's just a movie. Right? But there's truth to it. Yeah, I'd rather watch that instead of going watching Dracula. <laughs> right? <laughs> and some vampires and things like that. Sorry, guys, that's me today. <laughs> that's the truth. I'd rather watch that. So they said the rapture, and it's coinciding because for the last month I've been talking about the rapture and the second coming. How there are two different events biblically, we find that. The rapture is Jesus meeting with his church. The dead in Christ will rise first, and those of us who are alive will be caught up to meet with the Lord in the air, and we'll go and be with him. The second coming is Jesus coming with his army. Hallelujah. Coming to Jerusalem. We talk about that. And then right after that, now I get this, that these things are not true. Rapture. There's nothing called left behind. No. No, I, uh, but it, if you look at the word rapture, it's nowhere in the Bible. We know that. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. But the concept of it is there. Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said, Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three. So, for a better word, we say Trinity. There. Now the word rapture is not in the Bible, but the essence of it is there. In the twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ will rise first, and those of us who are alive will be caught up to meet with the Lord in the air. To be caught up. So that word for, a, for the Bible is not written in English, not even in King James. I have some people that God mad with me, I forgive them, that why I'm not using King James Bible. So I asked the lady, I said, if the King James Bible is the only Bible that the whole world will read, because that was the authorized Bible, I wanted to know if the Chinese have a King James. Do they? No. The Chinese have their own Bible. It's not called King James. 
If you go to Nigeria, how many tribes are in Nigeria? Probably 300 or something, <laughs> just like in Sudan. Each tribe has their own Bible in their language. It's not called King James. King James is a Bible written for English-speaking people only. It was translated. Now, I do believe it is really good translation. But these people take these kind of things and they begin to create confusion. So these ladies, oh, you're not preaching in this. I'm getting out of this church because you're, you're heretic. Can you see how people get carried away with all kinds of teachings? But I, I, I wanted you to go with me to First Timothy. We'll look at another scripture. I just wanted us to be people who can fight these things right. Amen. In these last days that we're living in. Amen. There are all kinds of teachings that are not really, you know, if you get somebody saved before you can train them in the ways of God, they go to YouTube and they start learning for themselves. I, I advise you not to do that. Talk to me first. Because you can go to YouTube and you will completely be lost. You'll find some people that will sound as good as Christians, but they are not actually. It is like giving somebody a, a, a gun in his hand and he's only two years old or four years old to shoot that gun. No, he can't handle it. He has to grow up and learn how to handle that properly. You see, uh, in First Timothy chapter 1, I wanted to read that this is Paul writing to Timothy. Timothy was a young pastor in Ephesus. He was believed to have... Uh, been chosen as a pastor by Paul. He was the one that uh, Paul called him my son in the faith. And he was very timid as a young man. So Paul wrote to him twice, First Timothy and Second Timothy, because he wanted to encourage him as a pastor. Paul as an apostle, verse 1 of First Timothy, Paul as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope. To Timothy, a true son in the faith, he said, Grace, mercy, and peace from our Father, God our Father, and Jesus Christ our Lord. I urged you, in verse 3, when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that you may charge some, it's a charge, a command, that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables. You see without that word fables? Stories that are just not founded, not grounded in the word, they're just made up. Fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification. It causes disputes rather than godly edification, which is in Faith. Everybody say faith. faith. See, when you hear that word faith, if somebody is trying to prove something to you, don't argue with them. Tell my brother, I understand where you're coming from. You're coming from the point of view of the world. They want evidence. I may not be able to give you those evidence because I have faith. I was not there when God said, let there be light, and there was. I was not there. I cannot prove it to you. But I believe it. We, that's why we are called people of faith. Full of faith. We have people of faith. I was not there when Jesus rose from the death. But I do believe he rose from the death. But science, yeah, well, well, you go with your science, I'm choosing faith. I believe in God. In fact, God is the greatest scientist there is. All these guys are, ooh, they are not. God is the greatest scientist. But there are certain things that we can't even argue with these people because it is by faith. By faith. And if we have to go by faith, then why are we arguing with these people? So the, the person that wrote this article is a Christian person who has been in the church. She said she believed in the rapture. She believed in everything. But somehow, 
He's always, he's always afraid. He lives in fear. You know why people are afraid of the rapture and the second coming of Christ? Because then they have to be ready. And they are not ready. Then they have to keep their house in order and they are not ready. You know, if I have, uh, you, they think he, Jesus coming is an interruption to their programs that they have. They have a plan to go party, a plan to get married, a plan to get all good things that they have, that they're planning it. And somehow, if he comes, he's going to put a stop on these things. So they're afraid of it. But actually, the coming of Jesus Christ is the best thing. The best thing that can happen to you if you're in a right position. You should rejoice. It's not something to make you sorrowful. There is nothing here worth holding on to in comparison to what God has done for us. That's why the apostle, he said, our moment, momentary troubles is nothing compared to what is awaiting us in glory. Can you compare this garbage here with what he's promising us there? Now, there is one thing. While we are here, we have to live our lives. Can somebody say amen? amen. This is not a fear trip that we're putting on you. So somehow you have to get out of here. See, we're telling our brother we're excited about his job. Wilson, praise God, he got a job. So we have a life to live here. We have to get good jobs. I do believe Christians need to be the head and not the tail. Above and not beneath. I believe that. But while we are doing those things, if the Lord ever comes and says, hey, brother, let's go. Are you going to say, well, you know, I, uh, I have a diamond ring that I was going to buy. Somebody said probably Lord's wife left her diamond ring when they fled from Sodom and Gomorrah. No, that's just a joke. That's why she looked back. Not knowing that in heaven, all these precious stones, even gold, we walk on it. So you kind of have to understand, what are you going to lose? Some people think, one guy said <laughs> that, that I'm a loser. He told me, he said, you're a loser. You, because, you know, because I'm not participating in the things they're doing. Okay, I'm a loser. You are trying to walk your life right with God, you're a loser. Being a Christian is, you know, you're just a loser because somehow you're not in everything that is going on. You're losing something. I don't think you're losing anything. You are blessed. Come on, turn to somebody say, I'm blessed. <laughs> Hallelujah, you are. And we need to be able to know that there is nothing interrupting us or nothing is going to be taken away from us just because we follow Jesus. We are not losing anything. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he said, for me to live is Christ. If I'm still living here, it is Christ. And if I die, it is gain. It is gain. So there is a day coming. And they can say all what they want, whether the rapture is true or not. But I do believe that we need to be very careful because there's a world out there that is trying to disprove everything that started from the beginning. It's a mentality. Have you seen young people in Canada, young people? They, they look down on seniors. How many of you are seniors? You consider yourself a senior. Lift your hand. Yeah. You know what? We need to honor these people. We need to honor them. You guys here, you know, go to McDonald's and eat your burgers and run around and you think you're cool. You are not. You are not cool. You see, these guys, they worked hard here. Yes. The elders, the people yeah. that make this land. That's right. They, but young people, you know, they walk around, you know, just. <laughs> and they despise elderly people. Not knowing how hard it took for this place to be built. But I know, young people, you need to look to your, those who have come ahead of us. They worked hard to build this country. Yeah, they worked hard. But you know what? Young people always think they're right. 
The old folks, they don't know anything. They know better than you. They have experience better than you. If you, if you don't listen to them, it's just a matter of a year or two, you will hear them, I told you. Yeah. See, they, <laughs> they know it already. You may not want to hear that word I told you. They will tell you. But you don't listen to it. This country was built and raised by these people. They use tools that we never had. Today, everything is done just quick. Even farmers, man, the, the machines that they built. I went and visited my friend in Muzjo, Greg Simpson. Oh, man, that combine that they have, it has a GPS on it. Everything is, you know, the seeds are put down using uh, air. Machine, you know, like you look at it like this, and then you can go to the museum and see the old combine that was used a hundred years ago, whatever it is. And you'll say, wow, how did they even survive that winter? They don't have furnaces. The house is not insulated. They, ride, they rode a horse to go to school. All those problems. I don't know if I was there, if I would have lived. What about the First Nations people? Right. You know, I read, I was reading the story. Uh, I, I want to educate myself about the history of Thanksgiving. And I found out that the Puritans, the Puritans, if you don't know church history, they're a group of Christians in England that wanted, of course, that word pure means they want to walk in holiness. They, are, they, they escaped, they were persecuted, they escaped from England, and they went to Holland. From Holland, they found out that there was a loose lifestyle in Holland. So they got out of there, and they went back to England, and they found out that there's a new country that has been discovered. The Western world. So they board, took the, 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 the ship and came here. And they, made, they, they met with the First Nations people. And they were almost wiped out because of they, are not, they don't know how to handle the weather. So the First Nations people came to them and protected them and made sure that not, 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 not many of them perished. Half of them died from cold. You know, you can come here during summertime and think everything is good <laughs> if you don't know, right? And they almost died, but the First Nations people took them. And then they celebrated their first harvest. And they did Thanksgiving. That's how the story came from there. There are all kinds of stories about it. But people don't know how... It first started. Today we walk around with all, uh, you know, you get into your car, you have your remote starter. Everything is easy. But it took some people to work really hard for us to receive this blessing where we are at. But let us not think that they are stupid. When they all trusted in God, then they trusted in God. Who were they talking about thanksgiving? They were talking about giving God thanks. Because he has blessed the work of their hands and the harvest was successful. Who are you giving thanks to today? Because you went to Sastel. I know somebody works in Sastel here. so <laughs> There's two people. And, and you worked and you got a paycheck. Who are you giving the glory? Who are you thankful to Sastel? Or are you thankful to God? Because Sastel will not be there without God. Oh yes. I do believe that. All the knowledge that we think we discovered, one day God will say, I knew it all then. I just released that knowledge to you to make that cell phone. Now I'll show you what I, may, what I have here with me. It will shock you. That is God. He just said, let there be light. And there was. He's a powerful God. Still, the telescope that they have right now they are getting pictures from heaven, from space, that they don't know what to do with it. Billions and billions of stars. So if heaven is there, where? Uh, I don't know. Well, there's no such thing as heaven. There is. God has a place. And so I just want to knock all this naysaying that is going on. Naysaying. People that are speaking lies 
They speak lies. So verse 3 of 1 Timothy, are you, are, you, are you getting encouraged today? Yeah, I just want you to go from here knowing that you are doing the right thing. Don't ever question where you are with God. Don't question it. That's where your faith is. When everybody else is saying something else, when everybody is saying what is right is wrong, and what is wrong is right, but you're still holding on to the truth, I'm telling you, this is what is needed in these last days. Even if you be left alone as the only person believing, are you going to believe? Job stood his ground. Noah, woo, preaching for 100 years, and only eight people get saved. That is a failure. That's a failure in today's world. You fail. See how many people didn't get into your ship? Your boat is empty. You only saved animals. So you failed. No, he didn't fail. He condemned them because he chose the right path. It is going to become really, really hard for you if you don't have faith. You should be happy that you're born again. Amen. Not shaking a whole sound. Oh, they're saying this. Oh, no. Let them keep saying what they're saying. We need to hold on to the word of God. Let God be true and every man be a liar. Can somebody say amen? amen. So in verse 4 he said, don't give heed to fables. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 4. Or endless genealogies which got disputes rather than godly edification which is by faith. Which is by faith. It is not by all kinds of arguments. It is by faith. Without faith it is impossible for anybody to please God. You have to have faith. I don't have to prove to you, oh atheist, that God exists. I don't even have to argue with you, but I believe he, he does. I will just share the scriptures. You see the disciples throughout, if you read the book of Acts, everywhere they went, they talked about Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. Now you go around here and talk to people, Jesus died, he was buried and he rose again. They say, oh, but what is that going to do with me paying my bills? Is that really relevant to me? Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. Well, what is that to do with me? But they preach the foolishness of the gospel to confound the wisdom of the wise. The, the cross is foolishness. It is stupid. That's why the Muslims don't take it as... They say no. The, 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 the Messiah, the, the Christ that died, the Christ that they believe in, Yeshua that they believe in, is not the Christian one because the one they believe in never died. Never will die such a, a horrible, shameful death because they don't understand that his death is a sacrifice. It took their place and my place and your place. Without Jesus dying, there's no Christianity. Without his death, there's no sacrifice. You would have been, today by now, you would have seen blood flowing all over here because you have to bring an animal for me to kill it. There will be blood flowing all over. You need to talk to King David one day when he was bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem as he enters in. First they failed, they didn't get it right because they didn't read the book how to carry it. So the next time they carry it on their shoulders and as they walk into Jerusalem, they go one, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, and then they stop, and then they sacrifice, and then they'll go again. I don't know how long that journey was. I was 
thinking maybe from here downtown. But what if it is from here further than downtown? There will be all blood all over. Every year you have to do that. Man, they lived a life that was so hard. But now we have, don't have to do that. We have Jesus once and for all. He died on the cross. His atoning sacrifice. His blood begin, is what you need. You appropriate it by faith. All what he wants from you is now to obey him. And, and I'm telling you, these things have to be taken by faith. You have to have faith. We live a, oh, you have to prove everything. It's like trying to prove. In calculus, I don't know if I remember those things. You prove this is equal to this. This is not a math class where you're trying to prove things. We're talking about God. The God of the universe, where he has spoken. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, the time has come. You see, you want me to nail down whether the rapture does exist or not? I'll, I'll get it to you. Let's go to Luke chapter 17, guys. You know, some people are tired of, they want to serve the devil so bad, they want to go and follow him. <laughs> Whoa. I'm going to be reading from verse 28 of Luke chapter 17 verse 28 and I'll read from there are you all there say amen, amen. he said likewise as it was in the days of Lord likewise just hold on there this guy that wrote the article he said, the God of the Bible is not a God who takes some people and leaves some people. Do you read your Bible? He is a God who journeys, he journeys with his people. He journeys with them, he, he struggles with them. I said, really? Then you need to talk to Lot. And you need to talk to Noah. God took them out. And then he brought judgment. God took Noah out. And then he brought judgment. He took Lord out. And then he brought the judgment. And it is in there. So the Bible says here. As it was. Right? Likewise as it was in the days of Lord. They ate and they drank. They bought. They sold. They planted. And they built. But on that day. That Lord went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lord's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whosoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you in that, that in that night there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other one left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other one left. What is that? One will be taken. One will be left. Who was saying this? Who, who was the saying this? Jesus. He talked about it. Now he didn't say rapture. He didn't say rapture. That's a word that we put. Just like uh, we don't have a term for something. So we find a word for it. Okay we'll call it rapture. But here the concept of it. Is right there. It's right there. But you know what? Like I said, the rapture is not supposed to cause fear. If it is not taught properly, people will think, okay, you've heard of people say, let's sell all our things. What is the purpose of going to work now? Pastor. No, that's not what I'm telling you. Go to work. Live your life to the full. You are called to occupy 
Because, hey, it's not about you. You are called to be here to do your job. See, Jesus was not concerned about his death. He knew he has to be here. After When he was 30 years old, he was baptized. And after he was baptized, he started his ministry. And he fulfilled his ministry up until he was taken And when he died, he rose again and he went. You have a mission. Live your life to the full. Go to work. Be the best worker that there is. Live your life to the full. This is not for us to sell our things. Oh, now there's no need because the rapture is happening. Oh, we didn't set a date. The Bible says nobody knows the hour. But we have to be prepared. We have to live our lives. We have to save souls. Amen? We have to enjoy living our lives here. We are not running away from here. But as long as we are here, hallelujah, we are going to preach the gospel. Now they will say, well, this thing has been talked about for years. How true it is. We'll close with this. First, uh, Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 3. I wanted you to look at this. This is Peter 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, Peter was talking to his generation. You think this is a new thing? People doubting the word of God, questioning the word of God. No, it's not a new thing. It's been happening <laughs> for many years. Every year there's some people coming. It's just becoming very prevalent now because, because of the media that we have. In Second Peter chapter 3, it says, Beloved, verse 1, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds. Somebody, somebody say pure minds. Amen. Amen. We have pure minds. You're born again. Your mind is not corrupted. But he's stirring up, hallelujah, that pure minds. Hallelujah. By way of reminder, that you may be mindful Of the words. You need to be mindful of not the devil is talking about. But you need to be mindful of what? Of the words. Hallelujah. Which were spoken before by the holy prophets. And of the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first. Knowing this first. That scoffers. Will come in the last days walking according to their own last scoffers. People that are scoffing, laughing, making fun of the very words of God as though they are the word of God is not true. Ah, this Bible. So they bring doubt into the word of God. Knowing this first, that the scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own last, and saying, where is this promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And for these, they will fully forget that by the word of God, the heavens Hallelujah. The heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the waters by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are preserved for abortion. And how many kids, you know, like I saw a documentary on, on about 20 dogs, puppies that were rescued in North Battleford. 20 puppies. And everybody was, oh, 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 that's so bad. We can't do that. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I don't say we go killing dogs. But these are people, humans, babies that are being killed. And today nobody's even talking about it. And it's funded by your own money. You are paying for the abortion. You're from your taxes. These things are happening. Oh, it's not science. It's not, it's still, it's not a baby. It is just a fetus. Now, you can call it fetus, but it's a baby. It is. I watched when I was in Bible college. One documentary was given to us to watch. If you watch that thing, 
terrible. They bring the baby first head out. And then they kill it before it comes out. So it's legal. Now who decides that? Talk to nurses that have abandoned that place because they were not happy. They become, some of them lost, they become, they have to go to the psych ward because they are mentally disturbed by what they saw. But this is the world we are living in. They reject the things of God. And because of that, they have to reject anything that says that God is actually true and he's coming. If he's going to come, they're not ready. They don't want to face him. So they were, well, he's not coming. But it doesn't change the fact that one day he will come. Can somebody say praise the Lord? His coming is better. It's not for me. Oh, if he comes now, then I'm going to lose my promotion. Oh, I'm supposed to get married to Mrs. X. Or whatever her name is. But now if I, if he comes, then that plan will be stopped. If Jesus is going to come and his coming is going to stop all the abortion that is going on, come even Lord Jesus. Thousands of children are getting aborted every year in Canada with your money. And you know what they're saying? They said, the birth rate in Canada is declining. Okay, birth rate is declining. The aging population is growing and the birth rate is not able to compensate the aging and the dying population. So what happened? Okay, well, let's go to the world and bring immigrants so they can work because to compensate that, okay? Now that's okay, you can bring immigrants, I'm here, praise God. But the birth rate is declining, and the aging population, people are dying, so there's no compensation to bring these immigrants. But why can't we just have the kids that are getting aborted raised up? Hey, why do we have to throw them out? Can you see? <laughs> it's, it's completely no-brainer for somebody to, to do that, but they do that. And what I'm saying is, we will never come to a place where we can stop these things unless Jesus comes. He, not even Stephen Harper can stop it. He's been a prime minister for how many terms now? He's a Christian. He can't even stop it. It's so ingrained in the society, and it's happening. And, and people need to stand up and begin to know these are the times. But these people, verse 8, look, he said, but beloved, do not forget this one thing. They say, where is this coming? We heard about it. Even in May 21st last year, they said that there was going to be the end of the world and nothing happened. We're not talking about the end of the world. I'm telling you this thing, whether you die and then it happens after you die, or it happens now when Jesus said it, and we believe it's going to, a day is coming when he will return. It will return. And verse 8 it says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some have counted slackness, but is long-suffering. He is long-suffering. That means he's very patient with us, not willing that anybody should perish. The same thing with Noah. He waited, Noah preached for 100 years. He gave them time and time and time and time. And God is giving people time. He's giving the world time to repent. He's calling on them to turn away. But they don't want to turn away from their sin. And that is the, I'm telling you, if you're telling me, why should God do this? He's waited long enough according to me. If it was up to me, it would have been done 10 years ago. But thank God I'm not God. <laughs> eh? So he waits because he wanted more people to come into the kingdom. He still waits. He's still waiting. But the time is coming, he's going to say, that's it. Enough is enough. Shut the door. Noah, get in. Noah got into his boat. 
I can see from a few kilometers away people running because the boat is on a hill. I'm just giving you a picture. I was not there. So people are running to the boat because they've never seen a rain. They've never seen a rain before. It never rained. For 100 years, Noah was speaking lies. He was a false prophet. He was heretic. There's never going to be a world flood. Nothing. Everything is good. And, you know, we've never seen something like that. Never seen it. It doesn't mean it won't happen. So they oh, everybody was doubting him. Actually, you get doubted even more if you have to preach for 100 years. 100 years is a long time. Noah was a... I will not want to be in Noah's position. It is a man of faith. Because if you have to preach to all your schoolmates, your classmates, your buddy mates, the one you played hockey with, you have to tell them all about this, and you're calling them for 100 years, and they will not come because you're, what you're preaching never happened before. There was no rain. And then you're told to build a, a boat in a place where there was no sea. More doubt more questioning. I know many of you are da- your friends. As soon as you talk about Jesus, they walk away from you. And you're feeling, oh me, nobody likes me. No, it's not. They don't like you. They don't like your message. They don't like what you're talking about. And Noah persevered for 100 years, and God finally told him, bring all the animals. You see, when you are really stupid. When you're lost, you're lost. If I was there and I've seen Noah at the 99 years of preaching, and then I saw all the elephants coming, and I saw all the boats, birds coming and going into that ship, from all over the world going into that ship, I would say, well, this guy is true. I'm going in there. Or let me repent or something. But these people are lost to the point where even when they probably recognize how this, why are all these animals congregating in that ship? What's going on there? They still, their heart becomes hard. And when God shuts you down, when he said, I'm done, you're, you're too stubborn, you're done. Even what is right, you don't even see it. Now he gives you time to repent. To turn away. And these people will not listen. But I'm telling you. You are blessed. We are blessed to be people that our eyes. Are open the eyes of our understanding. In these last days. Let us stand true to the word of God. Let's all stand together. Amen. Amen. Let's close. No. Hallelujah. The truth of God's word. Let's lift our hands to the Lord. Everybody say, thank you, Lord Jesus, Jesus. for opening the eyes of my understanding. I believe in your word. Your word is true. Lord, I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for my sins. I'm thankful and I praise you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus, that I am born again, that my name is written in your book, Lord. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that when you come, that I am ready. I'm ready, Lord. If you come today, I'm ready. If you come tomorrow, I'm ready. If it is tomorrow, I'm ready, Lord. Oh, Lord, I thank you. And I pray for my family. I pray for my friends, Lord, that you will use me as an instrument of righteousness, that they will all be saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord cause your enemies to flee in seven directions. May the Lord bless you in your going and your coming. 
that no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and we will see you next Sunday. Stick around if, you're, if you need prayer. I'm here. I will pray with you.